You're listening to Fueled, a Finstamaker podcast, and I'm your host, Catherine Finstamaker. Today we have with us Greg Palmer, who, prior to his retirement late in 2020, served Finstamaker as Vice President of Contracts and Acquisitions. Greg was a key member of our executive team and was heavily involved in setting the company's strategic direction. In his VP role, Greg oversaw the details of all corporate contracts, including negotiations, management, and closeout for our diverse client base comprised of state and local agencies and governments, along with private industry. Greg's tenure with Finstamaker began in 1984, and from there, he dedicated over three decades of his life to our firm. Greg was a driving force in the growth and diversification of the company. He certainly played a vital role in the development of our firm's work ethic, culture, and values. And having said that, I thank you so much for taking time out of your retirement life to join me today and talk a little bit about the history of the company. Thank you for the opportunity. This is going to be great. I agree. I'm excited. So should we just jump right in? Let's do it. All right. So you joined Finstamaker, as I mentioned, in 1984. Can you describe the makeup of the company at that time and the role that you originally assumed? Sure. I remember the first day, the first months was just a a new experience for me. I was leaving a company that I had worked for for 10 years and getting to meet new people moving to a new town, moving my family. The company was small, so we got to get to know each other. I can remember the people's names, where they sat, their personalities, a very unique blend of personalities. Mr. Fenstermaker and Mr. Curry were the mentors. Uh, They were the professional engineers, professional surveyors. And I was getting to join them as a professional surveyor. So that was a real benefit for me to have them you know, being in, yeah. the, in the new company. In the beginning, I brought work from Amico with me. Mm-hmm. So I That was your previous employer. Previous employer. Mm-hmm. So I had to finish up those projects before I could really take on a new project. But uh, getting to spend time with uh, Mr. Fenstermaker and just in talking about surveying, uh, about his work on the computer, was great to get to spend some one-on-one time with him. Yeah. So those were your kind of direct mentorship opportunities were Mr. Bill Curry and then my grandfather, who you call Mr. Fenstermaker. Mr. Fenstermaker, yes. Okay. So I had such a great respect for him. So. So you say you moved your family. So where were you moving from? I was with Amico for 10 years in New Orleans, and we lived in Slidell. Okay. So, so not too far of a... No, it wasn't. Not too far of a trek. It wasn't a major cultural experience. So. Yeah. Okay. So like you mentioned, you came from Amico, and that makes me curious what enticed you to come work at Finstamaker from our perspective, sort of making a transition from the client side to the vendor side? Great question. Well, this question comes from John Finstemaker. I'm not sure if it has his signature on it, but this was one of his questions for you. Uh, It was different at Amico. We hired Finstemaker and other companies to provide survey crews. So we didn't, Amico didn't have their own uh, survey crews. So we could go out and spend as much time in the field as we needed. Mm -hmm. It was up to me when I was out in the field with the survey crew. So I'm not going to say money wasn't an object that stood in the way where my supervisor, you know, don't come back until you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. So it was that type of attitude. And with Amico being a large company, then we had a lot of company. Like bureaucracy? Bi- bureaucracy, yes. So raises, step ups. 
So in the 10 years that I was there, I had bumped the ceiling of where I could go. Like hierarchically? Yes. Okay. So there was no other place for me to go. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't something I could I could get my supervisor's job was my only move up. Mm-hmm. And in getting to know Bill and RJ through work and through tennis, that it wasn't an issue with a family-owned company. I didn't know where I could go or what mm-hmm. I would be doing. But the freedom and the ability to move up in the company was just great. And that was the biggest factor of me coming to life yet. It is a little bit more nebulous at a family business, for sure, as far as roles and maneuvers and where you can transition and roles that you can assume. So I can definitely appreciate that. So that was the reason why I left, and um, I haven't regretted it for a minute. So Oh, that's so good to hear. <laughs> so as it was explained to me, you came to Finstamaker to work on the computer side of the business. Again, this is Intel coming from Uncle John. And you were assisting CH with his vision of fleshing out graphics behind the software that we were using at the time. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Amico was a leader in the oil and gas industry on the computer side. Okay. Uh, we could generate a map of anywhere in the world in just a matter of minutes, which was great for the geologist and geophysicist, uh, for the landmen. On the survey side, we were still doing uh, calculations longhand. Oh, wow. And with the handheld computers, it was easier, but still we were way behind. So as part of my role at Amico. I handled the offshore area throughout the Gulf. I had also picked up the computer interface, trying to develop software that we didn't have to go down and key in information into a key punch machine and go have it run, that we could be interactive on getting our calculations done. At the same time, CH was developing the software for Fence to Maker. Okay. And also looking for a graphical interface to be able to display the information rather than taking it to the plotter. Okay. Well, Amico had a budget of millions of dollars for Intergraph equipment. Mm-hmm. And I worked with the IT department to customize the Intergraph software to work for surveying. So it was a it was a natural fit yeah. when I came to Lafayette and getting to talk with CH and look at what are our options for something that is smaller than $10 million budget. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So us uh, we worked with uh, different companies mm-hmm. on the graphic side as well as the mainframe systems to develop Mm -hmm. and grow our capabilities at Finstamaker. And a lot of that is still being used today to be able to display our tabular data graphically. That's wild. I think in all of that description, you mentioned so many pieces of technology that I've never even heard of, like a punch system. Punch cards. A punch card. Oh, we would have I'm to go so down. I'm so lost. I would need pictures to so tell me what that is. We would go down and sit at a keypad and type things in and punch cards like the size of maybe three by eight with holes punched in it. And then that was given to the operators at the desk and they would run that through the mainframe and get out the information. Interpreted the results. By, based on the holes in the punch card. That is so... And if you made a mistake in yeah. typing that in, then you would have to wait two hours before you got something back that wasn't right. So. Oh, my God. Technology is just astounding it how is. far it's come. And I think about in the days of the next generation, like, will they know what a cassette disc is? Will they know what a floppy disc is? Will they know... 
what a CD is, you know, it just accelerates so quickly that things just become irrelevant in the blink of an eye. It's so wild. Uh, Our whole computer system then storage was smaller than my iPhone. I know. It's so wild. It's amazing. (laughs) It's been a wild ride, huh, through your lifetime watching it all change. It has. (laughs) So you dedicated decades of your career your career life to the growth and development of Finstamaker. How do you find yourself reminiscing about those early days? Sitting here in your office, I see orange panels on the wall. In 1980, the office was orange carpet. Really? Orange trim around the doors. Uh, The stairwells were painted orange. Orange was a big thing. So, <laughs> the aesthetic, huh? <laughs> oh, you, it was hard. To, it kept you awake, so mm-hmm. it was so bright. But even that brings back memories of those early days of you know my time here. So I moved here in 1984. 1980, you know, we were great prices in the oil and gas industry in 19. 19- 86 prices were down below $10. So it was very difficult for mm-hmm. the oil and gas industry. That being such a big effect in Lafayette, everybody yeah. was in the oil and gas industry. Yeah. Hence uh, the oil center. Yes. Yeah. And in 1986, Fence to Maker opened up the office in New Orleans. You know, we made that big move to expand our area of Mm -hmm. operations and opened up a beautiful office in the energy center in downtown New Orleans, Uh, a big step for fence to maker to do. So that was exciting to be able to do that. Then in 1989, after many months of negotiating cost and scope, we were awarded a multi-million dollar contract with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, okay. which we had the presence in New Orleans. We had the knowledge from the years of work that CH had done in the basin mm-hmm. that we were able to show our capabilities and qualifications to win a 10-year contract with the Army Corps of Engineers. And what were we doing? We mapped every ownership in the thousand square miles of the Atchafalaya oh Basin. Gosh, what an undertaking. So we had people in the courthouse doing courthouse research. Mm-hmm. We had staff in the office reading those descriptions, mapping those based on the the field work that CH had done mm-hmm. and others had done to establish boundaries. And then we flew, uh, did photogrammetric mapping and put all the ownerships on top of area photography. And that was revolutionary at that time, no? It was. It was. That's one of the negotiations took so long because what the Corps wanted was available at a price. Right. But we were with the technology that we had developed Mm -hmm. in the early 80s, we were able to negotiate that scope so that something that we could do within a $10 million budget. So, so you kind of came on during a dip and then saw us sort of rebounding. That's your early days experience was kind of coming in on a hard time and then sort of branching out. We, from divers- there. we diversified. We took the survey knowledge and files and records mm-hmm. that we had and moved that one step further mm-hmm. that we were able to do the mapping and, uh, we were in we were in the field, we monumented boundaries. It was a project that I truly believe was a financial blessing to the company at that point with a downturn and yeah. then having a ten million dollar project to work on. So that sounds exciting. Was, was that that was like a big number at that time, right? It was a huge number. Ten at that million time. at that yeah. time is like yeah, that number. was the limit that the New Orleans Corps of Engineers had that they could award. Really? After that, then it would have had to gone further up the chain. So I got you. Well, that's really neat. And it, what an awesome project. And cool. That's a lot of area to cover. Well, we it's like an all hands on deck thing. It was. People that weren't busy in the oil and gas, we were able to create these special projects 
group mm-hmm. and we had 12 to 16 people yeah. that would not have been busy otherwise that were constantly working on the core project. So. That's good. I like that story. So what strikes you when you think back about our founder who most people refer to as CH, but we've we now know you call Mr. Finstermaker. So what of his personality is memorable to you? Mr. Finstermaker was a I want to call him an original surveyor. He had worked for Texaco. He knew the basin. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was an engineer. He followed the footsteps of the original surveyors. Mm -hmm. And as a surveyor, that was my favorite thing to do, was to take the handwritten notes from from 1850 and go to the field and retrace in the footsteps of the people a hundred years before us. Yeah. So that was something that I knew he did. Yeah. And to be able to look in the files when Mr. Fenstermaker was in the field and see what he had done with a lot less technology than we had today. Mm -hmm. But I love to collect Bob wire. I mean, Bob wire has a history because the, how Bob wire was changed in the way it was made, you could date the age of the fences. I didn't know uh, that. So, you know, this property has been occupied for 75 years because the age of the Bob wire in the trees. So uh, CH and I could talk about that. So Mr. Yeah. Fenstermaker was very interested in all of our projects but to be able to talk to the person that had surveyed in the same area, like the Atchafalaya Basin, Mm -hmm. and the information that he personally knew, and his memory was amazing. He didn't forget anything. (laughs) He could tell me what he found and what it looked like, something that he had done 20 years before. For better or worse. For better or for worse. He remembered everything. He remembered it. Yes, he did. (laughs) You're not the first surveyor I've heard talk about the nostalgic aspects of surveying, like walking in someone else's footsteps, reading their notes, and and being thoughtful about those that have come before, and having like fond memories of you know even Uncle John talking about being out in the field with his dad and and being able to walk together like there it seems like serving it has some sentimentality just kind of like nested inside of it like it's inherently part of a surveyor to think that way is what it seems like to me it is it's a mentorship that we go through that we have to be mentored by somebody previous to us that yeah in part to us, their knowledge. Yeah. And to be able to sit down with someone like Mr. Fenstermaker and listen to him, you know, it's like being in, at the feet of the master to hear him talk about the basin and yeah. then to have areas of conflict and, you know, that he knew what had happened was, you know, priceless to me. Yeah. And I even think, you know, people who are new and coming in, they appreciate that about being at Finstermaker is that we have such a richness of experience with the people here that they know if they're coming in, that they have those opportunities for that mentorship. So I know that can be really special. So look, I've heard that my grandfather ran quite a tight ship. And I don't know if you reported directly to him, but how did you find our founder as a boss? I've heard the stories that preceded me in my (laughs) uh, time at Finstermaker. Uh I will point out that the coffee pot was located in the wrong spot. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Because it was right outside his door. And if the noise, the conversation got a little bit loud, which Mm. he did not like loud noises, he would step out. And it was amazing how five or six people could vanish (laughs) in the middle of their sentence. So 
And we also, the, the survey field notes came in in the morning mm-hmm. in a briefcase, and they were put by the coffee pot. Really? So they were, you know, our fence to maker express would bring them up from New Iberia. So it was a space that people gathered to Mm -hmm. get the handwritten survey notes from the day before. Okay. And you would talk, but then the conversation would deviate from the survey (laughs) notes. And now you've got... um, People dilly-dallying on the clock. A a little bit too long of discussion, (laughs) and Mr. Finstermaker would come out... He might not say anything, or he would go into Mr. Curry's office, Mm -hmm. but everybody got right back to work. They would just scatter. Oh, yeah. They knew. (laughs) That's so funny. He was so rigid. He really was so rigid, like from all the things that I've heard, just very particular, Mm -hmm. very matter-of-fact, and no nonsense. No nonsense, for sure. (laughs) So what do you consider foundational by way of the company's early values? And how do you think that CH helped to set that tone? From the beginning, CH always provided a quality product. Mm -hmm. And to me, that has been, for my 37 years, I've never questioned the quality of work that Finstermaker provided. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one thing that came from him was the quality of what he gave to the clients. Just operating with exactitude, operating Excel, like looking for excellence. Yes. Is that? So the, the ability to, you know, produce quality and I'm going to have to mention your grandmother, Miss Willie. Okay, I'll allow it. She would come visit the uh-huh. office, which was amazing. And to me, that is the, you know, our family is one of our cultural pillars. Pillars, mm-hmm. And I would always go to the front when Miss Willie came in. Oh, yeah. As just the loving person that she was. And she made me feel as part of the family. So it was, she's someone that I miss, but oh, definitely, yeah, the Miss Willie Garden, but the the loving care that she had for her children and her grandchildren, it was great. So those are the cultural things that I I look at is the because they were a team, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the you know our quality from Mister Finstermaker and our focus on family from Miss Willie. Oh, I love that. I love that you mentioned her. I think about her often. And even whenever I'm driving down this East Bayou and I, I pass by, you know, where she lived in the the latter years of her life. And every now and again, my mind will say, oh, I'm going to go stop by. It's the strangest thing. You know, she's been gone a long time, but I still think of her like, oh, she might be just around the corner. I could go pop right. in and have a, a root beer float with her or something, you know. Just, it's great how our, you know, the pictures in our hearts can bring us such joy of times past. So. Yeah, I agree. Beginning, just kind of switching gears, beginning with your first position with the company, how, if at all, did CH contribute to your professional growth and trajectory? Uh, like I've mentioned earlier, Siege and I had a common interest in the computer yes. and how the computer could save us time, could alleviate some errors that we would make in our longhand calculations. Okay. And just to go pull the file and look at 11 by 17 calculation sheets and all of that was in hand, handwritten. Wow. So you could transcribe numbers where the knowing that the computer was going to be redundant in what it did every day the same way. Mm-hmm. CH and I shared that common bond. And uh, so that is, that was my, you know, my, my first interface and first big project that I took on that 
with the company was working with him and the software that he did. Mm -hmm. And I think that tied us together a lot and mm -hmm. then to be able to move on to the graphics that we were missing. So Yeah. So you know, like y'all both had an affinity for efficiency. Efficiency, yes. <laughs> and math. We both loved math. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm glad that y'all had so many things in common and that y'all got to work on projects together. That's really, it's special thinking back on all of that. I wish, I mean, obviously I was so young whenever he passed, but I love hearing about y'all's encounters with him. And it's really nice to to get to know him even in his absence through y'all and your memory. So it's really nice. Are there any other standout characters that mentored you along the way? Anyone memorable that really helped to shape your perception of the company or industry? That one is, this one brings back a lot of great memories for me. Yeah. So, and I have to go back to my days at Amico, the 10 years I spent there. Mm -hmm. L.O. Ray was my supervisor, but he was a great, great mentor. Mm -hmm. And he always said that when the staff got their licensed as a surveyor, mm -hmm. the weight was lifted off of his shoulder because he was the only person there that reviewed our work and put his signature and his stamp, the work that we were doing under his supervision. Ah. So it was a, the years I spent with him was just incredible. My best friend at Amico was Bill Daniel, and okay. he's you know has been a friend of the of Finstermaker organization, still is today. He and I became licensed surveyors at the same time. He was the I'm going to use the word irritant because okay. he would stick his head in my office and ask me, have you done this yet? Okay, we call that an accountability partner yeah, exactly. these days, okay? But, <laughs> but I have to say, it was irritating. <laughs> <laughs> so he was uh, you know, probably a month ahead of me mm -hmm. in getting things done as far as getting licensed. But I do give him a huge credit and thank you for sticking his head in and keeping me accountable mm -hmm. to stay on track yeah. uh, with getting my license. Then, you know, Bill Finstermaker is an influencer in the office, in his other business, his personal life. Everybody knows Bill. I and know. it's just, you know, he has been a huge influence in my life. We have uh, that in common, you know. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Oh, <laughs> uh, your Uncle Brad. Mm -hmm. You know, we always called him Brad Dad. I mean, he was... I've never heard that. You know, Brad Dad. I mean, he was just <laughs> the dad. Oh. And the Eagle Scout. He definitely was an Eagle Scout that just ran through his, his being of being this Eagle Scout. Uncle Brad? Yes. Come on. Oh, yeah. So... I spent hours on the opposite side of his desk. Uh huh. So what he could teach me to do meant he didn't have to do it. Ah. He could get me to do it. Okay. But the conversations we had in the while, process, in the process, and uh, just uh, his family values, his son Greg, my son Greg, mm -hmm. were the you know the same age. Uh, Christy being older, he could give me advice on the raising a daughter. Yeah. And so Brad was very, very memorable. Yeah. Personal uh, and professional mentorship. Yes, absolutely. And RJ, I mean, RJ should have been a priest. Everybody that had a problem <laughs> came to RJ. And Problem did. solver extraordinaire. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he knew, I mean, he would listen and yeah. he would bounce it right back and help me realize the answer. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, RJ was great. Knew everybody in the oil and gas industry, but I should have wore his priestly attire. So, 
because people are going to come confess to him. So. I don't know if Judy would have liked that, no, though. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> she would have been missing out on too many morning walks. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so those, are your, those are your mentors. Those are. So. I love that. Well, we all need mentors, you know, in life. Oh, we do. We to do. grow. You know, it's interesting, like, as I get older, having now people – sort of look to me for mentorship, which I find is like an interesting perspective change. It's not just that someone seeks your mentorship, it's that you're willing to give it. And so that's a, you know, it's a gift. It's a gift to receive mentorship and then it's a gift to give mentorship as well. That is one of my rewards. Yeah. Is to be able to mentor Mm -hmm. and to see the, people here that I mentored that have become licensed surveyors. I love Uh, that. It just makes me so proud. And for a profession as a land surveyor to know that this person is going to be true to the profession. Yeah. And steward it. Yeah. And carry it forward. And then forward and forward, and you never know how many surveyors you may have created. Correct. correct. (laughs) Just branches out. So you wore many different hats within the company throughout your years here. Can you talk a bit about that and how your varying involvement allowed you an interesting vantage point on the firm? If you have ever been in my office, my bookcases... Yes. That was my life in a bookcase. Mm-hmm. Those hats that I wore gave me an opportunity to do different things, to grow in different ways, experience life differently. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as a PLS, getting to be in the field surveying, getting shot at by the landowner. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> being threatened by the landowners, Mm -mm. that we grow by that. You know, I'm protective of my home. Yeah. And people that I'm looking at putting a pipeline across their property, they were protective of their their property. So being that PLS, getting to mentor people at Finstermaker was a joy, brought Mm -hmm. joy. And that... PLS after my name defined who I was. Yeah. You know, I'm not just Greg Palmer. I'm Gregory L. Palmer, PLS. Yeah. So that was, you know, that gave me a sense of being because I was. Yeah, it carries some weight to it as well. A PLS. Yeah. Being a project manager is a different role because Mm. you've got somebody that you're trying to provide a service to mm-hmm. that, you know, they're basically paying the bill, you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to charge you, but you're going to provide a service. Yeah. So that brought a lot of different skills. A little, you know, you have to learn how to be a project manager, you know, to learn to listen. So that was a, a, a hat that I put on and took off. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we opened up uh, new offices, Mm -hmm. I was able to open up a couple of offices, which was a difficult hat to wear. It was an exciting hat to wear. You're in a different area. You're meeting different people. Mm -hmm. But this is the time management, uh, managing people. Mm -hmm looking at the finances, looking at new clients, a different hat, Mm -hmm. uh, a bigger hat, Mm -hmm. bigger shoes to fill as well. Mm -hmm. So that was, but very, very rewarding Mm -hmm. uh, for me. Then marketing, your Uncle John has got, you know, a big task on Mm -hmm. being the marketeer. So. I was, I did, uh, you know, a time with the marketing hat on and, you know, spending time at conferences. Yeah. Speaking at conferences. When you're, you know, in the exhibit hall and you've got competitors all around you, 
some much, much larger than Finstermaker was at the time. And, you know, evaluating mm-hmm. what are their strengths, what are Finstermaker's strengths, mm-hmm. uh, what are our weaknesses. So that was a, um, a learning experience. It was fun. I will mm-hmm. not back up from that, but it was fun times. Yeah. Uh, to be able to travel and meet so many different people that came by the booth. And, and have some good dinners, maybe. And great dinners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just and, saying. And great giveaways. You know, you had to be creative on what they were going to put in their, their bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, we gave away thousands of bottles of Tabasco sauce. Oh, uh, I love that. How is Fista Maker connected? It was home. It was mm-hmm. Lafayette. It was a, a sense of home that we were able to share. Yeah. But, uh, the marketing was definitely the most fun. Okay. My The last hat I wore was contracts. It was... Is that the most complex hat? It was the most complex hat. It was the most heartfelt for me. Really? Because it was a sense of ethics. Okay. And that's something that I'm very strong on. Mm-hmm. And when you're negotiating contracts, uh, the fairness of the contract. And a lot of contracts aren't fair. That there's things in them that just aren't fair. Mm-hmm. And that was for me, you know, that pulled the heartstrings for me that can I put my name that on this line and feel good about it? Okay. And that was my way of protecting Finstermaker. Oh, yeah. You know. That, Absolutely. That, That's the gatekeeper role. Yes. I feel very comfortable signing this contract because Finstermaker is fairly protected. Mm-hmm. We could make a mistake, but the contract is going to be what protects us. So yeah. that was my favorite and also you know, plays with my heart. So Yeah. So having done all of that from into the field to in the exhibit halls to between the lines of contracts, do you feel like all of that sort of played into like one another? Was it, did you see it more of a like stepping stones along the way? Like how did all of that form? Like, did that just deepen your appreciation for the firm? Did it like, how did all of those different perspectives contribute to like your overarching, I want to say like love of the firm because I know you have that. Oh. Obviously, you dedicated so much of your career life here. So I just wondered, how do you see the benefits of those various perspectives? And how did that feed into your appreciation and love of the business? In 1984, we were a small firm. There was a need for another PLS. Mm -hmm. I needed to gain respect. I was the new kid on the block. Okay. And to gain respect. And as the company grew, then there were more PLSs. Yeah. But there was a need for me to be something else. Okay. So it was stepping stone, yes. Like an evolution, it more an of evolution, a stepping stone. I, Re not recreating myself, just using different talents mm-hmm. that I had, different abilities that I had, mm-hmm. and a desire to do what I can do. And you know, looking at myself and going, yeah, okay, I can do that to make yeah. more and more valiant contributions. Yes, as your skill set grew and your career evolved. I yes. Based on, is it, I mean, you've been to uh, conventions and being able to step out and shake the hand of somebody that you don't know. I love that. Oh, I do too. It's just being behind the table is a little bit more comforting. Yeah. But stepping out in the hallway. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have stood behind the table mm-hmm. and kept that distance, but mm-hmm. so much more effective when move the table, I'm going to put myself out there. Yeah. There may be rejections, mm-hmm. but the people that are there, we have something in common. Yeah. And absolutely. being able to share the company that I love yeah. and our abilities that I'm proud of to somebody that might need those services, I had to get out mm-hmm. there and get in to the same space, into that bubble yeah. that we could talk. So, and find that fit if there is one. If there's a fit. To where someone needs help, we know how to help. Right. We can guide them to their solution, whatever it is. And if there's not a fit, let me point you to somebody that can help you. So, yes. 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 I have begged and groveled for coffee cups at those conferences because I love those coffee cups. But being a competitor, we're not going to give you one. But you, know, <laughs> you got to beg and grovel for it. <laughs> That's funny. So shifting gears slightly, I'd like to talk just a little bit about our internal corporate culture. What elements of our culture do you see as having changed or evolved over the course of these last several decades? And then on the flip side of that, what do you find has persisted? Oh, and I hate to use that up, but I have to think immediately do the right thing is was there in 1984 and it's there today that do the right thing Mm -hmm. you know do the right thing for fence to maker do the right thing for the client do the right thing so that one has definitely endured uh the sense of family endured the tough times in 1984 Mm -hmm. i think we only temporarily laid off one person Mm -hmm. and then hired that person back, which was a big thing for the company to do. Mm -hmm. But the sense of family was a driving force. And I know that's very important to the company today is Mm -hmm. family, the work family to the extended families to activities that we do together as family. Mm -hmm. Those have definitely endured so Mm -hmm. those are the two main ones for me was do the right thing and the sense of family yeah and talking about things like layoffs and looking at maybe whenever the bottom falls out in an industry and there are a lot of companies who just open the floodgates and cut everybody loose and i mean i've heard stories about you know just being here at Finstermaker where you no know, that hasn't been the case where it's been all hands on deck. Okay, how do we protect these people who have shown us loyalty over the years and preserve their ability to continue to work here while we go through a tough time and whatever that means, how like riding it out together and making it to the other side and not disheveling everyone's lives by letting people go and then you know, trying to scramble on the flip side. I think that also, maybe in your opinion, I don't know, but it speaks to like that, that family. Is right. that kind of what you're referring to? Absolutely. So you know, we haven't had those layoffs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have used different skills of mm-hmm. the people that we have kept. You know, it's been because our sense of family is so strong that the company is going to take care of its own. And it has over 40 years that I, you know, the 40 years that I've been aware of it, the the Finster maker has taken care of me and my family, you know, in times that I was sick, open heart surgery, the company was always there. And, uh, you know. I feel like that's something that I'm just proud of. Yes, you know? absolutely. I'm so proud of that. It's very special. It's very rare. And I feel like, yeah, I just, I can take pride in those decisions that have been made. They weren't my decisions, the family decisions, right. the firm decisions, but they're really special. So I'm sure that was neat to be a part of all of that and as it unfolded. 
Describe watching and being a part of the company's evolution over the years. What are some defining moments in your opinion? <laughs> oh, wow. Defining moments. When I look at the defining moments of my life, mm -hmm. somehow it's always associated with a person. Okay. Somebody has come into my life and done something, mm -hmm. you know, assisted me, corrected me, loved me more today than they did yesterday, something. So when I look at the people that mm -hmm. have into Fence to Maker for a short time or for a lifetime, like Dr. Cam. Yes. Was a moment in time. Yeah. Dr. John Foray is, I think he shifted, you know, our direction slightly. You yeah. Know, the, that needle moved a little bit. Like a tide shifter. Yes. I mean, Bill has always been a influencer and changed the needle when he felt the need mm -hmm. uh, shifted kind of put my finger on that no but I know he has been that strength in the company uh, Garvin Pittman you know, with his experience, great guy. Oh, totally. Uh, you know, I've sat and listened to him lecture, and I'm at the feet of the master right here. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, we have some special people. Yes, we do have those special people, and I think those are, to me, what I see have made, you know, a difference in the company that have. Yeah. I like your perspective on it, that a defining moment being attached to a person, because ultimately that's what our firm is. It's a collection of people. people. And, you know, their personalities, their abilities, but they do affect. They may not know they do, but, you know, looking back and, you know, to me, that's, you know, the people that I love and respect and yeah. can see that, that those changes have made. So, yeah, and I'm sure like whenever it's happening, maybe that person doesn't realize the impact, the full impact of their presence even, but it's nice to look back and I'm sure for us and for them to know that they were a defining, a defining moment. moment. Yes, yes. That's really yeah. beautiful. So what are some of the toughest lessons you learned along the way during your career? I know you've gained some interesting insights that others may be able to benefit from. So if you don't mind sharing some tough lessons. Tough lessons. Delegation. I don't do that well. <laughs> I have been to more than one class on uh -huh. trying to the importance of delegating. Okay. I can tell you why. Maybe I'm a perfectionist and I want it done my way. Mm -hmm. But that also means I'm going to be working 24 hours a day to get yeah. it all done. So it, over my life, that has been the biggest lesson to learn. To I'm still go. working on it. But <laughs> as long as the finished product is correct, uh -huh. then you don't have to do it my way. You yeah. can do it your way. And yeah, you know, your way may be shorter. Yeah. And so but that's been the the toughest for me is to delegate it. Yeah. And uh, let somebody else do it. So. I think that's a hard thing probably for everyone. I mean, to some degree. I mean, whenever you make a transition when you even have the capability to delegate something to someone else, I mean, in theory, it's a dream come true. But in practice, it can be a challenge to let go. go. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's tough to let go. And yeah. Let go, let somebody else learn and do. Yeah. And I guess for me, just approaching it as another aspect or facet of mentorship to say, I'm going to allow this person to grow. I'm going to give them some of the responsibility that's been placed on me hand it over and let them 
grow a little bit in taking it on. And that kind of perspective shift helps me a little bit. Right. There, there, <laughs> but it's still a re- hard. There's a reward to that delegating. Yeah, there really uh, is. And uh, to see that. Oh, uh, this other one I think is when there's a conflict. Okay. A conflict between a coworker mm-hmm. or a conflict with a new policy is to deal with it. Yeah. Today. Yep. Don't wait till tomorrow Mm -hmm. because it's only going to internalize and get bigger and Mm -hmm. bigger. But, you know, dealing just to deal with the conflict. To approach it, to not shy away from it, not let resentment build. Correct. All of the ugly things will keep growing. Mm -hmm. If left unattended. If left unattended. (laughs) I went one time to a panel discussion in New Orleans. It was actually a a women's leadership event. And they talked about the importance of having tough conversations and how to prepare for them and and how to successfully navigate tough conversations. And that I reflect back on that a lot. And it emboldens me at times to be proactive in having a hard conversation, even if it is uncomfortable, it is the right thing. It is the right thing. It's for me in some of those conflicts, you know, I didn't feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, it made me sick. It was hurting me. And, you know, once that tough conversation was had, I felt better. Oh, you can breathe. Such a relief. Yeah. And, uh, because you can't take an aspirin to get rid of conflict. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a, that conversation. Yeah. And some of those conflicts, there is no right or wrong. Mm-hmm. You just have to flesh it out. You just have to flesh it out. But yes, I definitely, those are my two biggies. So, Well, they sound pretty universal. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody can take comfort in the fact that they're not the only one right, facing right. Those, those issues. Moving on, in the face of adversity, through our downturns especially, what do you think is at the heart of this company that has allowed it to endure? The company has always had the desire to withstand, to do whatever it takes. It is a family business, Mm -hmm. so it's not a board of directors. Right. It's family. And... With the family working together, and I'm going to include me and everybody else in this company as being family, we're going to survive. Yeah. And there's nothing, there's not a force out there greater than a family that's united. And I think we all have that. Yeah. That we're going to, we're proud of the Finstermaker name. Yeah. And we wear it well and uh, on all of our shirts. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the that I used to say, you know, I had Finster Maker's name tattooed on my body. But, uh, <laughs> and so, now, I hope that's not true, but I won't search you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> my wife would not let me do that. Uh, but it is, it is there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's inside me, the love for the company and Mm -hmm. to have it succeed. And I don't know what greatness Finstermaker has in the future, but I know how much we've grown in the past 37 years. Yeah, And uh, I remember when we hit a certain spot in revenue, Mm -hmm. how we celebrated and, you know, to know the, the goals of the company today mm-hmm. it's just so exciting and i have there's just no limit in yeah. my opinion as to what finster maker can achieve you know what i like is how at some point you know you're with a firm and then it becomes a part of you like you care so much for it and you're invested so much in it that it is almost an extension of you or you are an extension of it. Do you know? 
I do. And to some of the decisions, I made them as if I were an owner. Mm -hmm. you know, because this is the best thing for the company. Yep. So because I care so much about the company. Yeah. Because the company, I'm a part of the company. Yeah. You know, and, you know, so to making those decisions and working as if I were an owner. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's a know, good mentality. Yeah. Well, I mean, once you take that, that I am an owner, then I have a responsibility. Yeah. A vested interest. I have a vested interest. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> Greg, I love chatting with you. You're so sentimental. It's perfect. What advice would you give to someone just joining our firm? What would you share that might allow them to better understand our culture and where we've come from? Number one, be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. Be honest. You, know, you can make a mistake. We all make mistakes, but be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, ask for help. Okay, that's a good one. You know, you're you're not out there on your own. You know, you're on a team. Ask for the ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I think having confidence in yeah. yourself as a new employee, you're part of the team. You're part mm -hmm. of the company. You're part of the family. Don't doubt your capabilities. You know, you've gone through the process. You're here for a reason. Yes. Be confident. And you've got to have that confidence yeah. in, in your in your ability. So that would be my advice. It's great advice. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> okay. Where do you think you were able to make an impact on our family business? And what do you hope to have left as a lasting impression? You mentioned sentimental. Well, here I go. <laughs> I'm here for it, Greg. <laughs> the decisions that I've made, the ethics that I stand for, that we have mm -hmm. to protect the company. That was my, everything that I did was mm -hmm. my ethical boundaries were there and I'm not going to see how close to the my ethics I can get. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to step over those boundaries. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to protect the company ethically was my biggie. So Yeah. And do you feel like when you passed the baton at your retirement, you felt confident that you had communicated that effectively and that, now that is being that sentiment is being shepherded by your successor. Absolutely, absolutely. And Angel, how is yeah? I Angel was gonna say Angel is great. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna ask how was your time mentoring her into that new role. It was some of the best times that I had. It was it made the thought of retirement so much better because you knew because I knew. That it was, I think the last part of your question was, what am I leaving behind? Mm -hmm. And, you know, leaving a part of myself with everybody. Yeah. And, you know, I knew Angel was the person that I was going to leave that little bit of me yeah. with Angel. And we had lunch together before this. Yeah, you know, we talk regularly, and uh, I'm very, very impressed with Yes. Angel. Oh, me too. She is so impressive. And, but... The thing she takes on, she's amazing. She is. She is. So, she's great. So, yes, I'm very, very comfortable with the, the future and the changes that she's tackling, and so... And succeeding. And succeeding, yes. Is, so... <laughs> I'm so glad that y'all had a crossover point. I mean, we had a year yeah. to spend together. It was great. So. I think that's perfect. I think so. it's it made for a really a smooth transition. And I'm glad that y'all are still in touch because oh, yeah. I know she I know she needs some of your institutional knowledge from here or there. Oh yeah. I got a call last week from, uh, <laughs> and I was like, I could give you that, but 
You're going to have to go to my room, my, to Angel. She's got, oh, she'll send it to you. Yes. So. <laughs> so, okay, we have arrived at the closing question. Okay. This is a question that I ask all of my guests in line with our podcast name, Fueled. What fuels you in general, in life, in your career, work, family? What keeps you taken? Without a doubt is my faith is number one Mm -hmm. for me and tied with the number one is the love that i have for my wife she's my hero greg i love that i hope one day to have a partnership like that she is my one she's my number one and definitely my hero that's sweet sally huh that's sally so (laughs) well thank you for sharing that thank you for bearing your soul for mm. us, sharing your knowledge and your expertise and wisdom. And yeah, thank you, Greg. Thank you. This has been, it's great. So it has been great. It has. No sweaty palms. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we can close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.